We in Israel may be small, but we are a great nation. As the Lord blessed Abraham when he told him to leave his house and led him to the promised land of Israel and promised to bless those who will assist his people. Israel today is facing many challenges. What are some of the major challenges facing her and how can Israelis deal with them? Hi, and welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and today we present Moshe Ya'olon as he goes into the major challenges Israel faces and the dominant issues that require urgent attention. Take a listen. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Shalom. Shalom. I'm glad to be here with you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends and supporters of the State of Israel. I would like to start by thanking to Joel Joe Rosenberg for his commitment to the State of Israel, for his passion, for his leadership. He's a great leader. I am here on behalf of the Israeli government to share with you the Israeli government perspective regarding the challenges that Israel is facing. But when I'm saying the Israeli challenges, I must say that we share the same challenges, all Western like-minded people all over the world. Those who are aware aware about it or those who are not aware about it. For 62 years, Israel has been struggling for its existence. Yet for 62 years, while fighting wars, and defending our citizens from endless terror, we absorbed millions of immigrants from every continent in the world and managed miraculously to prosper and flourish. I want to emphasize this point right from the beginning because whenever we speak of the strategic challenges Israel faces, people start being really gloomy and worried. So I have to remind you that the Jewish people in general and the State of Israel in particular have been in dire straits quite often, but always managed to overcome. We did so thanks to our capability to come up with creative ideas and endless courage and commitment to our state and thanks to the support we get from so many supporters we have around the world, Jewish and Christians alike. That's why I want to express right here my appreciation and gratitude to your unwavering support and affection. Once again, Israel faces a wide-ranging set of threats and challenges. These threats are often viewed through a micro lens, and we always focus our attention on the last event, like the Turkish Muslim Brotherhood provocative flotilla. However, I believe that we need to look at the bigger picture. In essence, I see four principal strategic challenges which are interwoven and interrelated. The first of these challenges is the growing strength of the radical Islamist camp that is determined to change the world order and put political Islam at the leading position. This camp is made of two groups. The first, led by Iran, includes Shia proxy Hezbollah, as well as notorious Palestinian 
Sunni Islamist terror groups such as Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and it is intensively supported by Syria. This group regards the struggle against Israel as a main tool for promoting its strategic goals of gaining regional and global power. The members of this group are accumulating unprecedented capabilities to treat Israeli civilians with short, medium, and long-range rockets and missiles. There are already more than 40,000 rockets and missiles in the hands of Hezbollah alone, many of them provided by the Syrian destabilizing regime, and several thousand rockets in the hands of the Palestinian terror organizations in the Gaza Strip. These rockets have longer ranges, heavier payloads, and better accuracy compared with the rockets this terror organization had in 2006, the Second Lebanon War, and 2008, Kassled Operation, when they last forced us to take decisive action against them in a way that deters them until now from putting our readiness to engage them again to a test. This radical Islamic group has also strengthened its regional influence by gaining power in Iraq, Sudan, and elsewhere, while defying the international community so far with only limited repercussions. The decision of Turkey to come closer to this camp is a clear reflection of the growing strength of this radical camp as well as a manifestation of the political identity of the Turkish leadership. Anyhow, if Iran will succeed in obtaining the ability to become a military nuclear power, in spite of the free world efforts to stop her, this growth of power of radical Islam will get a tremendous boost. The second group of radical Islam is made of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and their affiliates, who prefer to focus directly on the United States and its presence in the Middle East. This group continues, despite the difficulties it is facing, to constitute a painful threat to the free world. The success of the radical camp is, to a large extent, a result of the asymmetry of modern warfare. While the free world has to adopt a strategy that leads to victory in the most comprehensive meaning of it, a very demanding and at times frustrating mission that requires a wall of government approach and a lot of passions, the radical groups follow a don't lose strategy that is much easier to succeed in. This success can be seen through the growing interest of the West to minimize its presence and influence in the Middle East, to engage the radical Islamists while avoiding even calling them by name, instead of confronting the radical Islam. With this in mind, regional radical or radicalized powers like Iran and Turkey are already busy filling the void that will be created as the West pulls out, taking advantage of the weakness of most Arab states. The radical Islam's strategic threat is clearly one that threatens the very core of our liberal existence and our common basic values. The basic rights of men, the rights of women, religious freedoms. This is an ideology that disregards the great mass of civil liberties we all take for granted. The second challenge is the ongoing efforts to delegitimize Israel and dehumanize the Israelis in the international arena in order to isolate Israel, weaken it, and deprive it from the ability to defend itself. This is self-evident in the diplomatic world, certain elements of the media and the academia, an endemic amongst NGOs who control the human rights discourse and abuse it in order to bash Israel. The biased and flawed Goldstone report, as well as the reaction to the provocative flotilla, 
are perfect examples of the double standard Israel is held to. This assault on Israel's legitimacy is moving from the margins of the political discourse to its center, thanks to unholy alliance between radical Islam, radical Arab nationalists, and radical and naive liberals in the Western world. The rapid condemnation of Israel by international entities, including European ministers, long before the real picture of what actually happened on the Mavi Marmara ship was clear to the Israeli authorities themselves, let alone to those who hurried to condemn us, gives all those who believe in justice and fairness a lot of food for thought. When there is a totally false and unbelievable attempt to draw a line that connects the fate of the black population in South Africa in the apartheid time with that of the Palestinians by people who are committed to Israel's security, and when this kind of people speak about the terrible humanitarian situation in Gaza, in spite of the fact that there is no shortage of consumer goods or medical needs in Gaza, it reflects how successful the lies of the delegitimizers are in shaping the way important groups of people in the West think about Israel and the Middle East. The world talks about Israel's right to self-defense. However, I pose the question, what is a right if one cannot exercise that right? As a former chief of staff of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, I assure you that the Israeli forces operate in strict accordance with the code of conduct whose values are based on the principle of sanctity of life. This code of conduct demands that our soldiers refrain from harming civilians, risking their own lives in the process. And all this while our enemies deliberately cover behind their own civilian population, using children as human shields, as well as converting mosques and schools into launch pads for their indiscriminate rockets that target our civilians. Any military move we make to defend our citizens is being turned into a war crime and misconstrued in a concerted effort to undermine the very legitimacy of the State of Israel. This campaign is undermining the efforts of each and every freedom-loving democracy in their battle against radical Islamic terrorism, whether it is in Gaza, Afghanistan, Iraq, or elsewhere. This delegitimization campaign leads me to the third challenge, which is to a large extent based on some of the lies of the delegitimizers, and this is the fact that the Palestinian export narrative has dominated the international approach to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. According to this narrative, the conflict is about territory, and therefore it can be easily solved. The only reason it is not solved is Israeli settlement and stubbornness. The Israelis should therefore be forced to make concessions and withdraw to more or less the 67 lines, or else two-state solution will vanish. Since, according to this narrative, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the core reason why the Muslims don't like the West, the Israeli policy is the reason why the long-awaited great reconciliation between East and West is postponed. As a matter of fact, all of these elements are misconceptions, and adopting them is precisely why we are stuck in a dead end. Let me briefly explain why these are misconceptions. First of all, we have to realize that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not the core for instability in the region. It is one of many conflicts in the region and not the dominating one. The dominating conflicts in the region are Islamic Jihadism against the West, the Shia Sunni conflict, the Persian Arab conflict, and the eternal conflict between nationalists 
and jihadist, or generally speaking, the conflict between Middle Easterns, who believe that happiness is achievable in this world, and those who preach for happiness in the next world to be achieved by martyrdom, istishad, and the killing of infidels, non-Muslims, like Jews or Christians. The real core of instability is the Iranian regime, whose ideology is turbulent in nature and cannot accept the idea of stability that it considers as a ploy to prevent it from changing dramatically the prevailing world order. Then there is a myth that the core of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is what is called occupation. In the West, the term usually means the territories Israel conquered in the Six-Day War in 1967. But many Palestinians from all the groups, Fatah, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PFLP, DFLP, etc., and even some Israeli Arabs, use occupation to refer to all Israel, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River, as they say it in Arabic, in El Bahar, El Nahir. They consider Tel Aviv, Haifa, Ashdod, Sderot, Beer Sheba, or any other Israeli city, kibbutz, or village as a settlement in occupied territory, and to all the Israelis as colonialists. We should remind ourselves that the PLO was established and launched terror attacks against Israel before 1967. Fatah and Hamas charters deny the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish independent state. This denial is demonstrated in Palestinian leaders' rhetoric to include Mahmoud Abbas, who is considered moderate in the West. In the Palestinian educational curriculum, they deny it as well, in their media, and of course, in the Palestinian strategy and policy. For example, in the preparations to Annapolis Conference, 2007, the Palestinians refused to include in the declaration statement about two states for two peoples. They were ready only to say two states, meaning they do not recognize Jewish people's right to an independent state, right affirmed again and again in the international arena, not talking about our Bible. This refusal has not changed since then. I claim that if the solution is a territorial compromise within the land of Israel, west to the Jordan River, a final settlement would have been achieved long ago. But the Palestinian leaders, since the dawn of Zionism till now, rejected any partition plan proposal and reacted violently to any political initiative calling to this kind of settlements. Going back to 1937, the Peel Commission proposal, which was responded by the Arabs in what they call the Great Arab Rebellion, 1947 United Nations resolution calling for partition plan was rejected by the Arabs and responded by our independence war. They call it catastrophe, Nakba. And in 2000, it was an Israeli partition plan proposal led by Prime Minister Barak at that time in Camp David. It was responded by Arafat in the homicide bombers terror war. So the core of the conflict is not occupation, but the refusal of the Palestinian leadership to recognize Israel's right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people. Our verse of the day today is found in Genesis 12, 2 to 3. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And our prayer requests today are, number one, pray that God will disappoint the agenda of those trying to wipe Israel off the map. And second, pray for Israeli leaders, that God guides them to make the right decisions in these challenging times. Professor Bernard Lewis, put it right and articulately in his article published in the Wall Street Journal, and he stated, 
What is the, the conflict about? There are basically two possibilities, that it is about the size of Israel or about its existence. If the issue is the existence of Israel, then clearly it is insoluble by negotiation. There is no compromise position between existing and not existing. And no considerable government of Israel is going to negotiate on whether that country should or should not exist. And I believe that we are a considerable government in Israel. The next misconception is about economy. Many Westerns believe that the key is in economy. They believe, as the founders of Oslo believed, that prosperous economy can neutralize extreme nationalism and religious fanaticism, thus clearing the way toward peace and then toward a better security situation. I do agree that economy should be an important part of any strategy, but you cannot force the Palestinians to abandon the refusal to recognize Israel's right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people or to admit that the Jews have their rights and were linked throughout history with the land of Israel just because they enjoy a better economy and well-being. Israel wants peace. Israel yearns for peace. And Israel has been willing to make concessions for peace. However, the real Palestinian narrative, the one used for domestic consumption, consists, as you can see, of rejection of Israel's right to live peacefully as a democratic and free nation state of the Jewish people and of continuing the struggle against Israel in forms that change from time to time according to the circumstances. As long as there is no real focus, no real pressure on the Palestinians to end their incitement towards Israel and the Jews, their continuous glorification of terrorists and complete reluctance to educate their people for peace, there is no reason to believe that a solution can be easily found. The fourth challenge involves our relations with the United States. Israel and America share a history of close, and to use President Obama's words, unbreakable ties. We have the same peace-loving ideals. We stand shoulder to shoulder against the tide of militant, radical, jihadist, you name it, Islam. And when it comes to the fight against radicalism, we share more than ideals. Cooperation in the intelligence and military spheres saves American lives as well as Israelis on a daily basis. Prime Minister Netanyahu often poignantly notes that radical Islam doesn't hate the West because of Israel. It hates Israel because of the West, because we are a democratic haven, a beacon of freedom in a neighborhood which is not so open to such ideas. Therefore, the fourth challenge is to maintain this close and special relationship and to close the gaps that may have temporarily opened between us. This is crucial. Divided, we are weak, and our enemies will continue to take advantage of this. Only through unity can we defeat the forces of radical Islam, and only through unity can we succeed in empowering the moderate elements in Palestinian society and other Arab societies, so crucial for obtaining peace. In the coming months, we are going to see decisive moments in each of these areas. On the Palestinian track, the Palestinian Authority will try to use the proximity talks in order to spend the time until September, portraying Israel as the obstacle to peace, and then blame it for destroying the chances for peace in the future by resuming the construction in the settlements as the freeze period comes to an end. They will try to promote the idea of a forced solution in the frame of a Security Council resolution that will establish a Palestinian state along the 67 lines without them recognizing Israel's right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people and taking the necessary steps to provide security and fight terror. We are not going to let it happen. In the context of the assault against Israel's legitimacy, 
we are going to see more attempts in the form of more flotillas and in other forms to provoke friction and deprive Israel from its right of self-defense. The effects, as I mentioned, are that there is no humanitarian crisis and no shortage in consumer goods in Gaza, that our strict control over incoming products is caused by the extreme and violent nature of the inhuman Hamas regime that refuses to accept the quartet conditions for dialogue, denies for four years any visit to our kidnapped soldier Gilad Shalit, and threaten our civilians that the naval blockade is legal and that the flotilla was led by radical Muslim elements eager to embarrass Israel through the deliberate, sophisticated use of violence. But these facts don't suffice from convincing the free world to understand the real nature of the recent event and to fully support the State of Israel. And under this background, the delegitimization effort gains momentum. Regarding the radical camp, as the sanctions against Iran are implemented, we shall know whether they will bear the wished for results or not. If not, and this is a much more probable scenario, we shall have to understand what does the international community mean by saying that a military nuclear Iran is totally unacceptable. What is our policy on these issues? As I said, we want peace more than anybody else since we are living right in the middle of that volatile area and serve as a target of much of the violence. But we realize that obtaining a lasting and stable peace, a real peace, is not easy. It has never been easy, and it never will be easy. We therefore understand that in this case, just as in many others, the longer way is a shorter one. From day one of this government in Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu has made it clear that we have no interest in ruling over the Palestinians. It is neither our national interest, we hope this is nor theirs. In his Bar Ilan speech, Prime Minister Netanyahu recognized the principles of two states for two peoples while calling for direct negotiations. Hundreds of roadblocks, checkpoints, and barriers have been removed, not a small matter from a security military perspective, I can assure you. This government also implemented an unprecedented, to use Secretary of State Clinton's language, 10-month settlement freeze in Judea and Samaria. What did we receive in return from the Palestinians? We received their standard and predictable answer. We received the answer which we have received so many times in our short history. The answer for 15 months was a categorical no, as they piled on preconditions that had never existed in 17 years of prior negotiations. In addition to this rejectionism, the incitement against Israel and Jews continued. Terror is still glorified, and the Palestinian education system is still shocking in its content. Chairman Mahmoud Abbas, in his recent visit to Washington, was trying to please the Jewish audience by saying that he admits that there was presence, a presence of Jews in the Middle East in the ancient days, as his presence is mentioned in the Quran. But he rapidly denied a press report by the Israeli daily Haaretz that he acknowledged that the Jews have a right in the land of Israel. The lesson we have to draw from this is that parallel to a top-down process that by itself cannot produce a real peace, we must build the peace from the bottom up. Following the withdrawal from southern Lebanon in 2000 and Gaza in 2005, instead of receiving peaceful land, Israel received rockets tens of thousands of them. We will not make the same mistake again. 
Any Palestinian entity must be demilitarized and accompanied by an Israeli military presence on its eastern borders. Israel will not allow porous borders and the unfettered influx of military material into its eastern neighbors. We have to confront it in this context another myth, and this is the 242 resolution calls for Israeli withdrawal to the 67 lines. The truth is that the resolution deliberately calls for withdrawals from territories and not from all the territories occupied in the Six-Day War, and this withdrawal should be to secured and recognized boundaries and not to the 67 lines that were unsecured and reflected a certain situation on the ground in the end of the independence war. Let me remind you, in this context, what our late Prime Minister Rabin said in his speech before the Knesset on October 5, 1995, ratification of the Israeli-Palestinian interim agreement a month before he was assassinated. He stated, we would like this to be the Palestinian entity, an entity which is less than a state and which will independently run the lives of the Palestinians under its authority. The borders of the State of Israel during the permanent solution will be beyond the lines which existed before the Six-Day War. We will not return to the 4th of June 1967 line. In the same speech, Rabin also emphasized that Jerusalem would remain Israel's united capital. Our government is committed to keep Jerusalem open to all the religions, united as the capital of the State of Israel. <clears throat> Our government is readopting the notion that Israel's vital security requirements, defensible borders, a demilitarized Palestinian entity, control of a unified airspace over Judea and Samaria, electromagnetic security, and international security guarantees is the only path to a viable and durable peace with our Palestinian neighbors. In fact, ensuring a security-first approach is the only avenue to a real peace, and not vice versa. The Palestinians must understand and internalize that just as we recognize the Palestinian national right to a nation state, so must they recognize ours. Any peace treaty must be accompanied by an end of claims by both sides. This means categorically renouncing the option of return for 1948 refugees into Israel. and recognizing the right of the Jewish people to live in peace and security in their nation state. <clears throat> we are ready for peace. The question is, are they? Anyhow, bearing in mind the rift between Fatah and Hamas, and the de facto separation between Gaza and the territory controlled by the Palestinian Authority, we are ready to move forward on the peace process with Chairman Mahmoud Abbas while we seek an arrangement that will complete our disengagement from Gaza with minimal security risks. While we continue to pursue our efforts for peace, Iran continues to pursue nuclear weapons. The Iranian regime have deceived the international community, dragged her their feet, and sold nations false hopes of a diplomatic compromise. By persistently defying the international community, Iran is mocking the West. For Ahmadinejad, this is the name of the game, demonstrating that the forces of radical Islam are stronger than the West in order to make Iran the new hegemonic power in the region 
and the world power. Indeed, it is a nuclear weapons program that has become the symbol of the regime, the symbol of radical Islamic defiance in the face of an international community that has finally awoken to this threat by adopting sanctions in the Security Council and on a bilateral basis. Iran accumulates four kilograms of low-enriched uranium every day. It already has 70 kilograms of uranium enriched to 20 percent and more than two and a half tons of low-enriched uranium. Iran may be only a year to three years away from a nuclear bomb, according to Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. Time is of the essence in dealing with this danger. What are the implications of Iran that can acquire nuclear weapons? First and foremost, this is a very severe threat to Israel. Rafsanjani said that it would take one bomb to destroy the Zionist entity. Ahmadinejad has repeatedly called for the genocidal destruction of our country, to wipe Israel off the map of the earth. The question is, would the free world allow a state that is calling for the destruction of another state to obtain nuclear weapons. This threat becomes even more pertinent when we remember the numerous Iranian shipments of arms to Hezbollah and Hamas and its meddling in the internal affairs of so many countries in the Middle East. It is unthinkable that Iran would be allowed to obtain nuclear weapons. Thereby, thereby gaining the potential to transfer dirty bombs to its proxies, Hezbollah and Hamas, on our northern or southern borders, or elsewhere, to Europe or to the United States. A powerful nuclear Iran would extend its sphere of influence with relative ease across the Middle East. Any American hopes of attracting Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey away from Iran would effectively be dead as Iran's regional hegemony would prove magnetic. Likewise, the moderate states would probably try to improve the relations with Iran to avoid threats to their stability and at the same time with the realization of a nuclear Iran, the ensuing process of proliferation will become inevitable. Can the unstable regimes of the Middle East handle nuclear weapons? How will it be possible to stop nuclear weapons from falling into terrorist hands when nuclear programs appear across the Middle East? Let's be clear. The Iranian regime is looking for a new world order where radical Islam is a dominant force. Since a change from within in Iran seems to be remote, partially because of the free world cautious approach towards the freedom movement, we must stand united as strong free democracies in the face of this threat. The international community cannot afford to allow this despicable regime to obtain the ability to develop such weapons. <laughs> Mr. Ahmadinejad and his regime must face a dilemma, the bomb or survival. This can be achieved through a combination of real isolation of the regime painful crippling sanctions, moral support of the freedom movement, and a credible military option. I am quite convinced that when it faces this dilemma, it is going to choose survival. To stand fast and hold on to this nuclear program would be unsustainable, isolating, and potentially suicidal. There is a need for a clear strategy based on moral clarity. Jose Maria Aznar, the former Prime Minister of Spain, articulated in his article published recently in The Times. 
he stated. What binds us, however, is our unyielding support for Israel's right to exist and to defend itself. For Western countries to side with those who question Israel's legitimacy, for them to play games in international bodies with Israel's vital security issues, for them to appease those who oppose Western values rather than robustly to stand up in defense of those values is not only a grave moral mistake, but a strategic error of the first magnitude. Prime Minister Aznar went on saying that Israel is a fundamental part of the West, and the West is what it is thanks to the, its Judeo-Christian roots. If the Jewish element of those roots is up, upturned and Israel is lost, then we are lost too. Whether we like it or not, our fate is inextricably interwined. From an Israeli point of view, in spite of the magnitude of the challenges we face, I am rather optimistic. I believe that Israel and the Jewish people, together with our allies, and primarily the United States, can stand up to these challenges. For that to happen, we have to make the intensive dialogue between Israel and the United States deeper and based more on empathy on both sides. Both of them have to show more readiness to listen to the other and understand and respect the concerns and the logic of the other. There is room to believe that the coming meeting between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu will send this message of closing the gaps. My confidence stems also from the inspiration I get from the people of my country, and especially the young generation on top of it, our soldiers. What this young democracy has accomplished in the realms of security, science, medicine, agriculture, and the arts is nothing short of a miracle. I gain my confidence also from the slow awakening of the free world to understanding the scope and the nature of the threats we all face. It is too slow, but it happens. <laughs> and I gain my confidence from your spirits, our friends, and your relentless support to Israel. Let me convey to you our message from Jerusalem our eternal united capital. It's not only thank you, but it's a message that says that we have a lot of work to do now as Israel is facing the assault on its legitimacy. We would like you to help us in this war. We would like you to fight on our side. Unlike the war against terror or the war against the armies of radical enemies in this war between truth and lies, you can be very effective warriors, and we need you to show up and speak out in favor of, our, of the truth. We in Israel may be small, but we are a great nation. As the Lord blessed Abraham when he told him to leave his house and led him to the promised land of Israel, and promised to bless those who will assist his people. We are right and our strength and resilience are based on our conviction that we are right. I am convinced that our ideals, values, and principles will prevail. I am certain that the free democratic regimes will overcome the challenge of tyrannical radical Islam. It is our freedoms, our liberties, and our democracies that strengthen us. It is our economic and academic freedoms that have given us the competitive edge, the creative energy to flourish. This is our faith that shows us the right way. Now more than ever, I believe that the free countries of the world must stand together. 
We have a just and worthy cause to defend. Israel may be on the front line, but the scope and global nature of the threat we face is becoming apparent to all. We must face these challenges together. I would like to conclude with a prayer. Adonai oz le'amo iten, Adonai yevarech et amo b'shalom. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Thank you for your tremendous support to the state of Israel. God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs> you said the choice is clear. I would say that it was a newsworthy soundbite to me. Uh, he has a choice, the bomb or survival. And you felt, as you described it, if I understood you correctly, that he would choose survival, and that it would be suicide to continue on with the bomb. I'm not entirely sure, but you've got a lot more experience in this than me, but I look at his uh, his religious theology, particularly what he's saying about his end times theology, this idea that the 12th Imam is coming and therefore he has to destroy the little Satan, great Satan. Is your assessment, uh, the government's assessment, uh, how, how, let, me, let me not put words in your mouth, how would you assess that, that end times theology? Because it seems different from other radical regimes, though they're radical and terrible, but this seems uh, substantively different. How does that factor in, in yours and the prime minister's thinking? The one who makes decisions in Iran is not the President Ahmadinejad. He's the Supreme Leader Khamenei with the Council of Ayatollahs. And Supreme Leader Khamenei, in 2003, decided to suspend the military nuclear project. Why did it happen? In 2003, after the United States went to the offense, phase one in Afghanistan, phase two in Iraq. The main questions among law, uh, rogue leaders in our region was, who might be next? <laughs> who might be targeted in the third phase? At that time, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya decided to give up his military nuclear project. And at the same time, Ahmed, uh, uh, Khamenei decided to suspend this project for a while. In 2005, he decided to renew the project. Why? Because in 2005, he realized that the United States lost its political stomach. <clears throat> By the way, they're, they're clapping in recognition, not support of the losing of the stomach. But I think <laughs> that's that <be> the unclear. <laughs> what we claim, that in order to put this regime in the dilemma, bomb or survivability, they should be convinced that there is a credible military option. They know that the capabilities are there or here. They are not sure that there is a will to exercise it here. Well, if I can editorialize, I would say there isn't, which unfortunately, just being candid, leaves uh, your boss <laughs> as the wild card here. Aside from all of our bosses, the God of Israel, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, this is the great defense. He may use, however, the, uh, or, not, or therefore, uh, your government, because right now, you, you, I, would you assess that 
the current administration is, is open to military action while we re draw down in other places? According to our tradition, our forefathers, the chapters, they said, Tzadikim melachtam naaset bide achirim. It means the righteous people, their job might be done by others. So we help to be righteous people. On the other hand, they say, they said, im en anilimi, im en anilimili. If I am not to myself, who will be for me? So we should be ready. Ready, okay, I won't push you further than that, but that's uh... Back to Khamenei for a second, the supreme leader of Iran. Uh, is it, it's interesting the timing that you laid out. 2003, they set aside the military project. 2005, your assessment, they brought it back into motion. That was also the year, of course, that Ahmadinejad came to power, uh, believed widely because Khamenei said, gave him his blessing. Uh, with the re-election, or <laughs> stolen election, uh, of Ahmadinejad, there's a sense, certainly I have, others have in the United States, that. Khamenei has given a blessing to this end times theology that Ahmadinejad has. Is it, so if Khamenei has that same theology, again, how does that, uh, does that speed up or worsen your assessment? I mean, you're talking about one to three years, but it could get compressed uh, if they feel like they have to move faster. We have to follow the military nuclear project to watch it very carefully. As I believe many Western parties are doing, uh, and to be cautious for this uh, uh, option yeah. that the uh, Iranian regime will decide to go in a faster way to acquire the military and nuclear capability. Uh, but I believe that we still have time okay. to deal with it and to stop it, and I hope that Western leaders will make the right decisions. Preach it, brother. Okay, uh, amen. Let's go around and, and get an assessment of a few, a few regional leaders. But I want to start with uh, Vladimir Putin. Even though he's moved over to the prime minister role, he still seems to pull the, the strings in, in Russia. And the Russia made a statement recently that you know, the UN sanctions passed, they voted for them, but a couple days later, they said that the S-300 uh, missile system didn't count. It wasn't included in the sanctions. Uh, how would you assess Putin and Medvedev right now vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with Israel and their relationship with Iran? And what would the S-300 missile system being deployed in Iran, does that change the calculus for you all? I am sure that it is not within the Russian government interest to have a military nuclear Iran. In the last couple of years, the Russian government maneuvered, partly in the past because of economic needs they sold uh, weapons know-how, missiles know-how, nuclear know-how for money. This is not the case anymore. This is not in the first priority in the Russian agenda. There were some other considerations like reaching a kind of modus vivendi between the Russian government and the Iranian regime. We support you and you will not in be involved in terror activities in the former Soviet Union Islamic States. Mm -hmm. That's kind of modus vivendi. Last September, the Russian government crossed the Rubicon by joining the uh, uh, sanctions regime, supporting the idea of sanctions regime. With certain maneuvers that they need, so far they are not going to deliver the S-300 to Iran. It's a good uh, step and uh, it's very encouraging. And by joining the sanctions regime, we are encouraged from the new policy of the Russian government. But there are some more considerations regarding Russia and the United States, the games of the superpowers that we have to look at. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, we hope that Russia is on board not to allow Iran to have the military and nuclear capability. Turkey, moving quickly away from the United States, away from Israel, towards Russia, towards Iran, towards Lebanon, towards Syria. The leader, Erdogan, how do you assess him? Uh, he has emerged suddenly in the last few months as uh, a new player. I, I, let me not characterize, uh, I'd like to hear your characterization of him and, and the Turkish government right now. Traditionally, 
Israel enjoyed what we call strategic relationship with Turkey. I enjoyed it very much as the head of the intelligence in the 90s. I enjoyed it very much as the chief of staff until 2005. In the last eight years, Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey actually gradually moved Turkey from being a secular democracy to, in a way, even an Islamic republic. This is a dramatic change. And it, it's not just a challenge for Israel. When uh, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey decided to be associated with what was called the axis of evil, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, it means that this is a challenge not just for the state of Israel. If Turkey voted against the UN resolution regarding the sanctions to be imposed on Iran, it's a challenge not just for the state of Israel. And if uh, Turkey was involved in trying to cut a deal to allow the Iran to maneuver and to gain more time with the participation of Brazil, another challenge for the United States, not just for the state of Israel. And I hope that it, it, it will be made very clear to Prime Minister Erdogan that he has to make his mind. He can't hold the, the stick on both edges. He should, it should be clear, if he's a member of NATO, he would like to go on associating with the Western Party with all the advantages, especially talking about economy, from being connected to the West, or he prefers to go to the Islamic camp and to the East. I hope that this uh, uh, dilemma will be demonstrated and introduced to the Turkish public. I hope so too, I hope so too. <clears throat> a few more questions. Uh, I just want to ask you uh, personally, just uh, where did your family come from and, and how long have they been Israel? Just a personal background so we can understand you better and how to pray for you. My mother arrived to the land of Israel in, at the end of 1946 from Poland. She was a Holocaust survivor. She was the only one from her family to survive uh, the Holocaust. Mm. My father arrived to the land of Israel in 1925 from Ukraine. He was 15 years old at that time when my grandparents decided to leave everything, everything in Ukraine mm. in a village which is called Kremenchuk. Mm. After losing one of their sons, my uncle, he was murdered because he was Jewish. Another son was arrested because of Zionist activities. So they decided to leave everything and to go to Zion, to Jerusalem. For my wife's side, we can go back to the end of the 19th century, 1899. Her grand-grandparents left Morocco and walked on feet to reach Zion. It took them two years. It took them two years to reach Jerusalem. And we claim in our family history that they left Morocco in the 19th century and reached Jerusalem in the 20th century. Well, bless them. Wow. Well, thank you for listening to this episode and learning about the challenges Israel's facing and the right approaches to dealing with those challenges. If you found this podcast really helpful, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Are you looking for Jesus? You can find him here. Do you want a question for Joel to answer? Send us your comments, anything you want, to this podcast at joshuafund.net. And your feedback is incredibly valuable to us as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund Ministry team, I'm Carl Muller. Thank you for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.